<laughs> All right, you ready? Yeah, I'm ready. All right. Welcome to this episode of In the Hunt. This is Brian Bailey here, here in Charlottesville, Virginia. Uh, Mark Sweeney from Orlando, Florida, or Windermere. How are you today, Mark? I'm doing fine. Just uh, things getting back to normal, starting to, you know, get, get out there and teach more lessons and got players who are starting to, junior players starting to play this week. Uh, LPJ still minimum, minimum late July. Um, so they're trying to sort that out. It's been, been a little rough on them, but, but even, even the LPJ players are starting to think, all right, time to buckle down and stop just going out and playing fun rounds and actually start to test ourselves and get some pressure back on. Awesome. Um, and uh, how did, uh, I know last time we talked, you were down in Texas. How did that all go? Uh, Texas was awesome. It was the Merido, you know, Samaritan fund invitational. And it was a really cool event because it had, it had tour players of at all of different levels of tours um, all across PJ tours. It had a lot of really top D1 schools there, uh, top D1 players there, and had top juniors. And they all played the same tees, same pins, and everything. And um, it was really cool to see, you know, there were, I think one of the top juniors in the country finished third. Uh, and, you know, Hovland was in the field, Spieth, uh, a whole, whole bunch of really good players. So it was, it was, it was really cool. It was a really unique uh, situation where you got a bunch of different levels of golf um, all together playing the exact same setup. It's going to be, that's going to be an interesting case study. And we happen to have a couple hundred scorecards of that. Yeah, we got about 300 plus scorecards. We're going to do a, a really fine tooth analysis of, of how that looks and actually create a um, report on it, do a case study on it, which will be really fascinating. I can't wait to see it. Yeah, that, that sounds great. So, uh, so today's episode, we have no guest. Uh, it's just Mark and I, and we're, we're going to call this uh, how to move to your next level, how, how to reach your next level of golf. Um, I've gotten a lot of feedback via Instagram um, saying I'm an amateur. I want to become a, you know, a scratch player. I want to become, I'm a collegian. I want to turn professional. What are those numbers and what does that look like? So in this series of videos or episodes that we're going to do um, over the next couple months, we're going to dive into different parts of the GFI and talk about what's good, uh, what expectations are, and just have a better understanding of what we're trying to achieve inside of GameForge and performance. So the, the number one thing that, that we get hit with a bunch because we're both putting coaches uh, is what is good putting? How do I become a better putter? Um, so, uh, Mark, I'm going to throw you that softball out at you right there. How do I become <laughs> a better putter? And how does GameForge help me do that? How do I become a better putter? Well, yeah, it's – Putting is fascinating. Um, I, you know, I study all the metrics, but we spend a lot of time on putting. And I want to start off just at the high level so people understand, you know, when we started GameForge, we, we basically statistically said, what are the best predictors of score? You tell us, not what we think, but let, let the systems tell us and the statistics tell us. And, and across the board, number one that comes up is total putts, putts per round. And, I, and we were both guys who bashed on it and people all the time bash on putts per round. Because they say, well, yeah, but you could, you know, hit 18 greens and have 32 putts and shoot six under. Or you could have, you know, hit zero greens and have 18 putts and shoot even par. And, yeah, and, you know, it, it's really easy to, to bash on any single statistic by taking a corner case scenario and saying, yes, but in this situation, it doesn't work. You know, I could take fairways and say you could hit 14 fairways and shoot 90. I could take, say you hit 18 greens and shoot 90 yes is it possible yes but they're outliers they don't happen very often and the reason that total putts comes back so strong is because it touches all areas of the game it doesn't only touch putting performance and conversion rates and three putts it also touches approach accuracy so if you hit 15 greens to 30 feet your total putts is going to be high because you didn't hit it close enough right if you miss um, if you miss 18 greens and you pitch it really, really close and your proximity is good, you're going to have, you know, decent total putts. If you, if you hit it like normal people do and you have a spread between, you know, six feet and 40 feet, uh, most people have fairly even spread in that range uh, and you putt well, you're going to have below 30 putts. If you putt badly, you're going to have above 30 putts. You know, and the fact is any pro tour out there, you need below 30 putts to stay on. It's just there's nobody who stays on PJ Tour with 32 putts average or on LPJ. They just don't because, because it is such an all-inclusive stat. And so what we've both learned through this process is it's a really good metric. Um, so we start with kind of total putts and we kind of work our way down from there. I think it's fascinating because I, I, I bashed total putts because I was lazy. I heard other people bash total putts. You know, and, it, and again, I was driven by narrative and the outliers. 
it's really easy in anything in life to pull an outlier and say that's just not true but you know but once we started doing the research and really started breaking this down and this got verified by uva data science as well that total putts really is a great predictor into understanding how you scored you know I, that was just me being a bad coach and just kind of accepting uh the norm of what what was what was said um so i did a bad job as a coach because i kind of threw that away as, as just being oh yeah you know because you know the, the it's really easy to say well i know a player that had uh you know i had 14 putts on you know 18 holes well you didn't hit a green I get yeah. it. Like, you know, like, you know, uh, I've heard you're this not gonna, story. And, you won't, and you're not going to do that twice. Yeah. You're not that's do that a twice. once in a life. That's a once in a lifetime experience. And I bet you weren't under par, <laughs> but you know, again, right, right, it, right. it's that, it's that concept of, of allowing the outlier to, the, and I, I think that's what's wrong with golf. A lot of times is we're, we're driven by a narrative and not the facts all the time. So I think, you know, like I said, as I've gotten to understand performance better uh, via Game Forge and, and all the modeling we did and all the players we work with, to me, I, my number one thing I look at immediately is total putts. Then I look at uh, my in positions and I look at my scrambling. And yeah, so you give me those three things, I can probably pretty well predict what you're going to shoot within a shot or two. Um, so, so I think what's fascinating is, you know, so now I'm a player, I'm saying, all right, whatever handicap I'm at or what, what my goal set is, total putts is a great indicator. So if you're not keeping any stats, just using total putts as a, as a narrative is a good tool. But now as I'm saying, let's say I'm a good junior. I'm averaging, you know, juniors are averaging 33, 32, 34 putts, somewhere in that ballpark. Now I want to be a collegiate and collegiate to, to professional. What is, what is that step? Total putts have to drop, but even deeper is what, what, where can I get in deeper to figure out what needs to move to keep keeping me allowed to move step to step? Right. So if you're, if you're kind of above 32 putts, <clears throat> I would probably look first at, at three putts. So, you know, tour players have about 0.5 three putts around. So it's about one three putt every two rounds. College players have about double that, right? They're about one or more three putts around. By the time up you get, by the time you get to kind of mid handicaps, they're having two to three, three putts around sometimes. And so, you know, just, just looking at your three putt numbers. Um, first of all, I'd like to see where those are. But I'd like to look at, it's really a combination of, you know, how many in positions do you have? And uh, at the higher levels, you're P6, right? So if you're not scrambling well, every time you miss a green, you're going to have two putts, right? So if you're hitting 12 greens and you're missing six greens, there's 12 putts right there, just right out of the bat. So, so total putts is, is a common, you've got you've to see what area of the game is causing the multiple putts. Is your, P, is your three putts high, but you're not going to say more than a shot around on that typically a putt around, right? Is your P6 really low, meaning I missed the green, I'm not hitting anywhere close on my second shot, and I'm at least two putting those. Um, and then you, and then finally, lastly, at a higher level, I look at conversion rates. So are you, are you two putting too often between 10 and 20 feet? Are you missing a lot of short putts? You know, it's kind of a, kind of a combination, but, it, but it, you really have to look at all areas of the game. You have to look at approach proximity, scrambling proximities, and conversion rates. And those change as the player gets better. As, as the scoring gets lower and lower and lower, it becomes more of an issue of conversion rates. And, you know, as the scoring is much higher, it's probably more of an issue of three putting and um, P6 is not being high enough. Yeah. And I think and, – and P6 is, for those that don't know, those are every time you miss the green in regulation, so par minus one, how many times do I wedge up within six feet? So that could come from a fairway. That can come from the fringe, bunker, rough but that's that six foot diameter or 12 foot diameter circle, six foot radius around the hole is kind of inside of inside of game forge. What we talk about is a, is a really good scrambling shot. Um, just in case you didn't know, but I think that's fascinating. I think that's a great way of training it. So if a higher handicap getting rid of three putts, that's huge. That can make a big difference. That's low hanging fruit. Um, I know inside of aim point um, speed has been a big part of getting players better. I've, I've done a bunch of speed clinics, um, you, you are the big part of creating all these speed clinics. So for the listener right now that says, hey, I three putt way too much. What can I do? You know, what are some steps for me to become a better three putter? What are some expectations? How, how can I stop three putting as much? Yeah, that's a great question for amateurs. It's a combination of uh, your lag putts. Okay, so it's speed and read on lag putts and short putts. It's not your 10 to 20 footers. 
Um, you know, those are where your make percentage goes up as you get better and better, but you're really not going to improve that dramatically. I don't think is a mid handicap or high handicap. You're not going to make a bunch of 15 and 18 foot putts, but what you can do is you can understand, you know, once you're outside 20 plus feet, um, you've got to understand how high the read needs to be. So, so by under reading putts, you're dramatically making your second par saving putt, uh, longer farther from the hole so i get them to really kind of overread. you know do a good aim point read but if anything air on the high side get the ball coming as high as possible but also understanding that for speed control it you know outside 20 feet 25 feet you do not want to get everything to the hole you don't want everything past the hole because the way dispersion works you kind of want an equal number of putts that are short and long and i see a lot of juniors who are like well everything's got to get to the hole well you know 20 feet in yeah you got to get the ball to the hole because you're trying to make birdie but at 40 feet that's a the problem is if everything gets to the hole then your longs are going to be six to seven feet past the hole and your shorts are going to be six inches past the hole and so you're you're three putting way too often so it's a combination of understanding you know the speed um strategy changes inside 20 feet versus outside 20 feet reading as high as you can and then your follow-ups, then just being good inside five feet. And most, you know, higher handicaps are, are fine at two and three feet. And then four, five, six, their performance drops pretty dramatically. So just understanding the longs and the shorts, you know, can dramatically help get the three putts lower. And then the second stage would be, okay, now let's make more birdie conversions. I think that's fascinating. I love the fact that you just said that at distance, speed and read is much more important than start line. And I, I see on putting greens everywhere in the world, uh, when people are putting, the one thing that they always work on is start lines. Um, so I think it's, again, a different way of thinking of golf is when we're at distance, now you have to have a, a reasonable start line. You know, you can't miss things by eight degrees. But as, as long as you have a reasonable start line and a reasonable impact, um, speed and read really drive long putting. So that is definitely, I think, a skill that can be gained by a high handicapper. And it's a skill if they gain that, they can really become out of the high handicap and get into mid handicaps pretty quickly just by understanding. Because a lot of high handicaps aren't going to hit it close to the pin. When you do hit yeah. the greens, you will be at distance. So, again, that's understanding your game and how can I attack. So I would encourage you as a player, if you have a coach, push them on that aspect of one, I got to hit it closer. But if I'm not, how can I set up a, a plan to be better at distance so I can start shaving strokes at what my game is right now? as I'm trying to move up. Again, I think a lot of people target where I want to be and train to what you may, maybe Tiger Woods does, but you know, Tiger doesn't play my game. He wouldn't be Tiger Woods if he did. Um, so just understanding what I'm capable of, how can I get better and, and reduce strokes? And I love that aspect of understanding speed. Not everything gets to the hole. Juniors are terrible and, it, and it's the never, never up, never in mentality. Inside of 20 feet, I'll give it to you. Outside of 20 feet, I'm, I'm happy three feet short as I am just three feet long from 30 feet. That, that's fine. Inside of that zone, I can make that. Uh, again, that's just a different mindset, and I think it's a different way of talking about speed control than you hear from a lot of coaches out there. Yeah, I, I, <laughs> I, I did a drill once with two um, very high-ranked juniors a couple of years ago, and it was a five-, six-foot drill where they were competing against each other. And they were both smashing their putts. Like it was either in or it was five feet past. And I go, what are y'all doing? You've got five footers and you're hitting it six feet past the hole. Like, what are you, what are you thinking? And they're like, well, you know, our coach penalizes us for leaving short, but there's no penalty for hitting it way too long. So, but, but the way they, the way they had been, you know, um, incented, the incentive was, as long as I'm past the hole, I'm not going to get in trouble, even if it's seven feet past the hole. And I'm like, no, 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 no. You, you, that's, that's, that's not quite right here. Cause you're not gonna, otherwise you're three putting from five feet. We don't want, we really, really, really don't want to do that. Yeah, so I really had it, you know, <laughs> that's bad for score. <laughs> so that was, that was actually a coaching problem or, you know, maybe the players should have kind of figured it out themselves, but you know, that, that was a, a bad incentive on coaching, but a lot of juniors think that way. They think I'm going to get yelled at if I leave this short. Um, and Yes, birdie putts, you don't want to leave them short, but you sure don't want a three putt from 12 feet either. So, you know, four feet long is as bad as two feet short on a birdie putt. But as we get out to distance, as we get out to our lag range, which for most players would be outside 20 feet, for tour players would be closer to 30 plus feet, you know, because they had 25 feet, they're still, they're still making some putts there. Um, the dispersion you get is about 10% of the length of the putt. So if you have a 40 foot putt, a tour player is going to hit it um, about a 10% dispersion, meaning they're going to be about four feet from the hole, long or short. 
right? So there's a four foot radius circle on a 40 foot putt. So if the center of that circle is past the hole, their longs are, might be six or eight feet past and they don't, they don't do that. You don't see tour players um, averaging past the hole at 40 feet. They, their average leave is pretty much right on top of the hole. So meaning they have an equal number of long and short. And, um, and I spent a lot of time explaining that to juniors and college players that, you know, if you hit a 35 footer and it's two feet short, it's fine. It's as good as two feet long. It's fine. Like move on. You know what I mean? Like don't sit there and go, Oh my God, I left it short. Um, I'll beat you up at eight feet for it, but I'm not going to beat you up at 40 feet or 30 feet for it for sure. That's so there right. is a strategy change and that's an important piece of it. And, and so y'all are listening. If, if y'all are, if you think never up, never in it on every length putt, um, reconsider, please. You're going to really, you're going to really lower your three putts if you do. <laughs> that's right. Cause at 35 feet, you leave it two feet short. You did your job. You know, the, 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 the numbers tell you is I can keep it in that 10% long or short. I did my job. So to me, if you, once again, if you kind of change the strategy and change this understanding, that's a success. That's a win. So when you walk off the putting green, I succeeded. I did what I needed to do on that putt. It didn't go in, but I, I didn't escalate issues and create three putts and four putts. And I don't know what it's called after a four putt. Um, so I think, again, uh, having that understanding of I did my job. I can kind of hang my hat on that. And that's a positive. Now I go to the next hole. That's a positive where I think a lot of people, well, I didn't make it or, you know, I didn't get it there and they're mad and they're walking on the putting green. Like I didn't do, no, you did your job. So again, I think it's a mindset of just understanding a misconception that has been spread in golf about what is good at different distances. Um, so higher handicappers, boom, there's your best way of really starting to take the high fruit, you know, where can I improve quickly? Now we're starting to go mid handicappers to trying to get to scratch. So what do you see um, performance wise? They're, they're sucking the three putts out. Their ball striking's gotten better. They're getting more opportunities to make birdie. What, what do you see that transition mark on how to, how to kind of start moving up from that in that mid handicap to a scratch player? Yeah. So now we, so now we need to rate our, raise our conversion rates, right? So now we need to make more putts. Um, particularly in that nine to 20 foot IP zone. Uh, that's, I always call it the hard zone because, you know, you can get away with some flaws when you're inside six or seven feet, you know, your aim doesn't have to be perfect. Your read doesn't have to be perfect. Your speed doesn't have to be perfect. And you can still make a lot of putts, but that goes away by eight or nine or 10 feet. That goes away. I mean, you've got to be accurate to one degree at 10 feet to have any chance of making the putt. You got to be accurate to half a degree at 20 feet to have any chance. So that means all your errors combined have to net out to less than, you know, half a degree at 20 feet. Um, so it puts more pressure on having an accurate read. You can't just have an okay read and an okay start line and okay speed if you want to convert at the rate you need to convert at, at in your IP zone, in your 9 to 20 footers. You've got to start putting all the pieces together. So if you're only sitting on the, on the range, on the putting green, working on three-foot start lines, that's not going to help you make more 18-foot, 15-foot putts. It's not. Um, when, I, when I work with higher-level players like tour players, usually the reason they're missing those is speed control like 90% of the time when they miss, it's a speed miss. And it's really highlighting how important and how dialed in your speed has to be 10 to 20 feet to, to make the, the you know, we need to make 30% of those on average. Um, that, that really highlights that that's for them. It's usually a speed issue because usually their, their reads pretty good to be at that level. Their line's pretty good. Uh, Mid handicaps. Maybe it's a combination of all of them. You know, I see a lot. If you're not doing aim point, you're kind of, you're kind of just, guessing at your read out there and and again you, you know you don't guess at yardages if you're 185 in the fairway you kind of want to know you're 185 you're not just winging it well if you want to make a 18 foot putt you've got to know down to a couple inches what the right read is and what what the area that you can make that putt is you can't just guess at it you're just not going to make enough um so that's that's where you really start to having to put all the pieces you're putting together by the time you really need to start converting those birdie putts yeah and i think that's fascinating because kind of what we see in the system like juniors that are trying to become collegians are making nine to 20, probably in the 10% range. They're making roughly 10% of their putts from nine to 20 feet. So as a good ball striker, which most juniors are collegians, you know, they're giving themselves seven, eight opportunities to make birdie 20 feet and in. Uh, four of those are roughly coming, you know, nine to 20 feet and they're only making one. Um, so Maybe. four or five. Maybe. So they're making roughly one putt in that zone. But as you start moving up, as you become a collegian, now it's becoming one and a half to two. High-end collegians becoming two and a half, you know, getting kind of starting to sneak to two and a half. And then tour pros are making, 
you know, 30% on average, high end players are making close to 40 winners can be making up to 60 to 70% of those putts in that zone. So, so there's definitely a, a maturing, I think, as, as you start to learn golf on what it takes to be a good putter. I don't, you know, the, the myth of, you know, I put it great when I was a kid. Well, no, it doesn't show that. Um, you might have thought you put it great as a kid, uh, but you know the, the that's, that's your memory. That's your memory. Just remembering all the good things about golf. Not right. all I, remember that, I remember that one hole when I hit the forty footer up over the hill, and it, yeah. So <laughs> the progression is there. So I think what's fascinating, again, kind of as I'm a mid handicap and I'm starting to set goals, now I'm going to start looking in the, at my GFI, at my conversion rates. What are they? What's my next level? What's my next step? And now I'm going to start training to that target. So uh, how do you kind of implement some of that training with your, with your better players as they're trying to move through that? How do you kind of isolate like weak areas, strong areas and, and ways to improve that? Yeah. I mean, I do assessments every time I work with a player, I do assessments. So I, I worked with a LPJ player this morning and we started right off the bat. Let's do a six feet in assessment. You know, our goal is 75%. She made one out of four. So she made 25%. She was like, whoops. Um, you know, we got a little rusty here. And then, uh, and then we went on to our IP zone nine to 20. The goal was one out of three. She made her one out of three. Um, and so, you know, very quickly, what we saw was that on the shorter putts, she was a little short and a little jabby and had a little, some face issues. So her face was twisting because her stroke was short and jabby. And then as she got longer, she smoothed out. Her speed was spectacular. Actually, her speed was really good. Her, she does aim point. Her read was good. Her line was good. So she hit her numbers on longer putts, but on shorter putts, it was a, it was a motion problem. It was how she was moving the putter was causing some face twist. And so we, we had to go in and dig into that. Um, sometimes they get up there and they don't read it and they get lazy and they miss because they're just not reading the putt, you know, and, and as a coach, if you're watching as a coach, you should be able to pick this out pretty quickly with three or four putts. If you're, as, if you're a player, it's a little harder to know whether you hit your line or not. Um, but you know, any good player should know if they're hitting their line. It's like when you hit your driver and you look up and you expected to see it somewhere and it's not there. You, you've missed your driver, right? <laughs> you expect it at a certain spot when you look up. And the same with putting. If you're trying to hit an inch outside the hole and you look up and it's already higher than an inch, you missed your line. Um, so it doesn't take a lot of putts. And then so what we'll do is we'll do the assessment, say, okay, you're, you, you missed way too many short putts because you're, you know, in my opinion, her, her stroke was different than it is on longer putts. Let's go work on that. Let's come back and reassess. You know, I love did, that. Long I, putts, I, I, you know. Yeah, I don't see that in the general public. Anytime I'm a putting green giving lessons, I'm always watching what other people are doing. And I think it's fascinating. I don't think – now, if you're just getting ready to go play and you just want a couple putts to feel the speed, maybe see one or two go in, I'm all for it. Do what you need to do. But I see people practicing all the time, and they're just randomly putting, no real thought to it. So I, I love the idea of, of understanding the different zones. So in game forge, we talk zero to eight feet, nine to 20 uh 20 to 40 is kind of the main zones inside of ball striking and conversion rates and and you need to assess yourself and actually get in those zones you know the easiest way to assess is drop 10 balls randomly in that zone put them and what did you do you know that tells you what percentage of make you're making uh you know your gfi you can go look at that and then you can make those assessments and if i'm underperforming now we got to figure out why you know yeah. and i think that that's the key, right? We don't, we don't create an issue. We solve issues. So right. if I'm not making, why, what's the reason? Is it read speed line? What, what does that come up? Now let's go work on that component and come back and reassess. I, you know, I don't see the wheel of learning happen a lot of times on the putting green. I see it's more reaction and just doing, if I hit a thousand putts, that makes me better. Mm, probably not. It makes you impressive that you hit a thousand putts. Um, but it doesn't mean that you're better. So I think if you're not assessing and understanding where your performance level is, where you want to go, and how to kind of assess and see where you're at and be able to start making strategic change um, as a player, you better get a coach. Um, if you're a coach and you're not providing that, you better become a better coach. Um, <laughs> you need to start giving that feedback to get your player better. And I think that's a concept I, I really see not implemented. Um, and I, I was a victim of this. Before we did Game Forge, we all, we all did it. I didn't do the numbers yet. I kind of, you know, I throw out putting numbers and you should do this or that, but not into the specificity of I do now and not of the understanding I do. So, again, same thing with Mark. A lot of the drills I do, you know, my favorite ball is seven ball drill because I work with high end players. That's basically three balls inside of eight feet, four balls outside of um, between nine and 20. And your goal is to make three to four balls. Like you got to do this. This is this is this is how you're gonna make money and, and survive on the tour. If yeah. you don't do it, 
Now we can lessen that for higher handicaps, but again, it gives you that concept. So again, I think as a player, um, if you're not as, assessing is just, is just highlighting areas of improvement. It's, it's a quiz at school shows you where you're strong and where you're weak. And I have my tests coming up. I know I need to apply more hours here because I already know this um, golf's the same way. You've got to understand where you are, what your strengths and your weaknesses are. And when you figure out weaknesses, how to attack. And I, and again, I think, yeah, Mark and I are having a conversation about a podcast we're going to have coming up later on in the week uh, about, from a different sport about how do they get really high-end juniors doing spectacular things. And then kind of we in golf have trouble having a player not make a four-foot putt. You know, where is the disconnect between those sports and how that happens? So I think a lot of that is the way we train in golf and, and kind of the understanding of golf. So I think, so to me, it's all about understanding who you are and where you want to go. If you don't know those two waypoints, it's hard to really move. You know, I think it was, uh, it was Yogi Berra said, if you don't know where you're going, you'll never get lost. <laughs> yeah. yeah, Correct. Yeah. But you'll never get anywhere either because you, you got no waypoints. So understanding the, the two waypoints on either end is important. So when you bring a player in and, and you kind of have that, like a, a really good junior that's getting ready to go to college and they have aspirations to play professionally. What does that conversation kind of sound like inside of the putting world? Here's where you are. Here's where you need to be and how we're going to get there. You know, what, what does that kind of sound like, Mark? Well, it, it's easier with juniors because juniors are already playing a game that, you know, if they're going, if they're good junior, they're going to college, their ball striking is good. Their putting is decent and you can be a great college. You can have a great college career with okay to decent putting. Right. And the nice thing with the juniors, you've got, you know, four to five to six years before they want to go pro. And so I just lay out, listen, here's where you are now. If you want to go pro, this is where you need to be by the time you by the time you leave school. Um, and so there's a lot of time there to develop into it. And I said, this doesn't have to happen. Doesn't have to happen today. But if you want to go pro and make a living doing this for X number of years, you have to perform at this level. It's non-negotiable. Um, and, I, and I told the story this morning, actually, in my lesson. I had a player come who's a who's a good college player. Um, wants to go pro, I think is one year away from going pro, but her, her putting make rate is not good enough to be on tour. Like it's good to be, it's okay to be a top 100 college player. And she, she's not gonna make a dollar on tour with it. And so you get to a point where you have to have the hard conversation, um, which can go one of two ways, which is, you know, with this player, she didn't want to make a change that I thought was necessary to get her make conversion rates higher. Um, it was basically, well, I don't want to do that. And, and the answer at some point as a coach, you have to make a call, which is, all right, you can't, you don't have to do what I'm telling you, but you cannot continue where you are. If you want to get to the next level, you can't, I'm just telling you, you might, you might be a top 100 college player. You cannot make a living on tour putting at this level. You have to make a change. It doesn't have to be the change I recommend, but you have to do something. Now, one of two things happens when you say that to a player as a coach, either they, either they, totally commit and they go all in with you or they never you talk to you again. or they fire you and, and they never <laughs> talk to you again. And unfortunately with this one, I haven't talked to her since that was like a year ago. So I got fired on that one, but, <laughs> but there, there comes a point, you know, where you hit a wall with a player where we're not, we're not getting through this. So I'm just going to lay my cards on the table. You need to make a change. Your call, your, it's your life, it's your career, but you need to make a call. But I am telling you, you can't live on tour with that level of putting. It has to go up another notch. So you got to figure it out. It's whether it's with me or another coach, I don't care, but this, these are just the facts. Um, and you'd be surprised how many players just stick their head in the sand and they don't want to hear it because you're challenging their belief system because their belief system is I'm a great college player, which might be true, but they don't understand the gap between college and pro. And there is a gap there. And, and you can tell them all you want and you can show them stats all I want, but some just don't really want to bite into that apple, you know? Yeah. I, I call, I always call those uncle Brian sessions. When I, when I have that conversation with a player, like, you know, here's your uncle. He's not your dad, so you might listen. I'm going to lay it out to you. Make it, and it's going to be really difficult, and it's really going to challenge you. Uh, but, but here's my belief, and here's what I've learned. Do with it what you want. So I always call it, and then my players even call it Uncle Brian. And they're like, oh, God, here comes the Uncle Brian session. Uncle Brian. Uncle Brian showed up. I, um, everybody's got an uncle like that. I had an <laughs> uncle like that. <laughs> he didn't care what I did. He'd he lay out some, some pretty good advice, but he didn't care whether I took it or not. <laughs> yeah, you know, that's what, that's what the beauty of an uncle, you know, you're, you're invested, but you're not. You, you get to go home to your life and your house and your wife and kids right. or whatever. You don't have <laughs> right. to deal with, with the ramifications of, of your advice. Um, right. I, I think that's fascinating, too. Um, 
I, I know um, a, a coach in the system that referred a player to Mark and I. Um, she was a aspiring female professional, had a really good collegiate career, um, wasn't making enough putts. And I think this was the most, I think the coolest story ever. Um, basically, she told us, you know, I had a phone call with her. You know, the coach said, can you talk to her real quick? So we kind of went through the numbers and I said, hey, you know, we, we'll, we track something called BIP rate. So every time you hit it in position 20 feet and in, what is your conversion rate? Um, and we kind of have some numbers for that. Colle a good collision is around 40 to 50%. Uh, a touring pro is 50 to 60 to maybe even 65, depending on level of, of tour. Um, so this player is averaging about 48% of her BIP rate. So, you know, basically making roughly half of her putts inside of 20 feet. Well, that's not good enough on tour. And I told her, I said, you've got to go to 60%. And she looked at me and thought I was crazy. There's no way in heck I can drop 10 balls between two and 20 feet randomly and make six putts. I'm like, well, you can, you will if you want to be professional. <laughs> <laughs> Uncle Brian's here. Uncle Brian's if, in the house. If you want to be a professional, you need to do this. And to her credit, you know, again, could go two ways. What she did for three weeks is did no other putting drills other than just randomly drop balls between two and 20 feet. And basically she said, I've got to make six. And it took her three weeks to figure out how to make six. Um, and to her credit, and then the next three events she was in, she won one. She, she won the first one, finished second in the th second one, and won the third one. And every single putting conversion change was 60% or above. So she did nothing. She changed nothing other than expectations and basically expectations on her and what her expectations were just changed. She didn't change her stroke or equipment. She didn't change her coach. Her you know, I was just a supplement. But so it was fascinating that she achieved that number as soon as she believed that the number was achievable. Uh, and, you know, I always credit that to like the four minute mile. Nobody beat the four minute mile until somebody did. And then once people beat the four minute mile, a bunch of people beat the four minute mile. I don't beat the four minute mile, but a lot of people do. Yeah. Um, so, so it's that concept of understanding what's expected. I think we've done a really bad job in, in the industry of giving expectations and that can be a podcast in itself of why that is. Yeah. Um, but, but once you, you know, I always say, it, you know, I was a school teacher for part of my life. I coached golf for nearly over 20 years now. Once I, you know, Uncle Brian comes in and gives expectations. It's amazing when there's expectations, how the player reacts and can adapt to that quickly. With, you know, if you don't know where you're going, it's, you don't have anything to achieve to. So I think a big stress for any player is where are we at and what are my expectations to my next level? And I think GameForge will give you that with benchmarking and understanding that. And then just reach out to Mark and I will definitely help you with that. But just understanding what, what is my step? You know, I'm a, I'm a 12 handicap. How do I get to a nine? I'm a nine. How do I get to a six? You know, there, there's some expectation changes. And, and if you don't know what those are, it's really hard to train. Yeah. I mean, I ask everybody, especially when I get new students, I, every time I ask them, how many of these putts should you make? You know, how many, how many inside six, how many inside eight, how many inside 20, how many, you know, what's your three putt rate be? And nobody knows. I mean, nobody. And I don't care what level of golf. I don't care if they're 10 years old or 35 year old tour play. They don't know the answer. And so if you, if you don't know what your make rate is, it's hard to, it's hard to identify flaws. Right. So if you're supposed to be making 30 percent in IP range and you're making 20, but you think that's fine, you don't understand there's a flaw there. And so you don't go attack the flaw and you don't try to say, well, you know, I thought my speed was good, but it's really not as good as I thought. You know, it needs to be a little bit better to get to this 30 percent number or um, so. So anyway, that's, you know, and I never I didn't know what these numbers were before two or three years ago. And now now I, I don't know how you could train without it. And then you apply it to short game and full swing and and uh, ball striking accuracy. I mean, if you don't know the metrics and you're trying to play a very high level sport where there's a very slim margin between the top 10 in the world and the top 150 in the world, a very, very slim margin, like a half a shot margin. Um, it's really hard to shave off or you need to shave off if you don't know what these metrics are. Yeah. And you're just guessing too, at that point. So you might think you're, you're taking point, you know, taking a percentage from here, but maybe that's not, there's not enough to, to milk that score out of that one percentage. So again, I think it's really fascinating. I know, uh, We've gotten pushback, I know, inside the system, uh, especially in short game. Uh, most of the short game drills, if you hate them in the system, that's my fault. 
Um, I, yeah, I, always, I always told Brian they're too hard. He goes, they, they are what they are. That's, they not, are what they are. We I'm not very good at the wedge, so they're hard for me. <laughs> we, we had a touring professional that told us these, these, these short game drills are way too hard. There's no way I'm this bad of a chipper. And, well, needless to say, she didn't keep her card. Um, <laughs> but, but, you know, and I'm like, I have 15-year-olds that are performing at or better than these numbers. So I know the numbers are right. And the numbers have been proven over time, thank goodness. But, again, it's just understanding concepts. And, and again, I, I think it, the beauty of, of any system that you use, you've got to understand where you're trying to go and what those matrix look like and let's set up a good game plan to get there. Um, I think having a coach is a huge piece of that. Um, but I'm biased. I'm a golf coach. But I, I think the beauty of the system, too, is we created something for you as a player to hold yourself accountable, set your goals, and figure out how to get there. And if you're having trouble reach, bridging that gap, definitely reach out and find someone that can help you bridge that gap. You know, it, it's I, I was kind of a self-taught golfer. I'm, I'm a decent golfer. You know, I can go out and I can shoot in the 70s. Um, never really had a, a true lesson. Well, I've had two, and I hated both. Um, so, you know, but I read a lot, I learned a lot, I listened a lot and I taught, you know, right. If you, if you want to learn something, you know, if you can't play teach, right. Well, I didn't know how to play or teach and I tried to figure it out myself. Now I look back, I could have done it different. I probably could have been a better golfer faster, maybe even better golfer than I am today, uh, by, by reaching that. But again, if I would have had game forge when I was learning all this, I would have been a much better player quickly as well. So again, I think understanding your expectations and then be world-class. We, we've kind of talked the progression mark. What does a world-class athlete on the putting green look like? So give us kind of a snapshot. Of, of their make percentage or yeah, all around putting? Yeah, kind of like think of so, like, what do they yeah, look like? So, so world-class um, putter is going to be, you know, 27, 28, 27 would be really good, but 27, 28 putts per round. Um, they're going to have less at maximum one three putt every two rounds. Okay, six feet and in, they're going to convert at about 85%. Okay, eight feet in, they convert at 75%. So if you drop balls like three, four, five, six, seven, eight, that's six balls. You got to make 75% of them. You got to make four out of six of them. Uh, sorry, four out of, yeah, four out of six of those. So 75% inside eight feet. Um, and people go, oh, that's too high, that's too high, because they only make 50% from eight feet. Yeah, but if you, if you add in the threes and the fours and the fives and the six, you need to make 75% or better. Um, and then the hard one, uh, nine to 20 feet, the IP range are converting above 30%. So 35 ish, you don't get too many that average higher than 35, 36%. So a third and, and they've got a pretty even distribution. Like if you go nine to 20 feet, it's fairly even, you know, how many nine, tens, 11s, 12s, it's skewed a little bit closer to 10 feet, but not much. So it's a pretty even. So if you want to test yourself, go, go, up, go drop balls, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13 all the way up to 20 feet you got to make one out of three one out of three is what kind of the, the best do and when they win they make uh 40 like you said 40 to even 60 percent of those so two out of three they get up to almost two out of three when they're really really on fire and that's just that's just incomprehensible putting to most people yeah and and then what do they do uh at distance is there a big separator at like Distant 20 to 40. 20 to 40 uh, there, yeah, there's not a big 10 to 15 percent. The tour average is 10, about 10 percent. Um, we see players up about 15, about 15 or so is about as high as they get. Make rate uh, 20 to 40 feet, but they're not three putting hardly ever. Yeah. Um, but you really don't get much higher than about 15 percent out there. It's like one in eight from 20 to 40. So you really just, that goes back to our speed. You're going to make one once in a while, but you just want to really reduce three putts. And when you make one, you make one, but you don't want to be giving up shots 20 to 40. You want to be neutral. Some, some players actually gain shots out there, but not, not much like a third of a, you know, 0.1, 0.2 shots around something like that. Yeah. And, and like I said, I talked about that seven ball um, a drill. Again, if you want to play, be a touring pro, you know, the goal is drop three balls between zero and eight feet. You know, basically, I usually two to eight feet, I'd two, six, eight, what, somewhere in that ballpark, and then get, drop four more balls randomly from nine to 20, you know, kind of spread those out. And, and then your goal at minimum tour would be three. That'd be, that'd be like, yeah, that'd be really scraping four, by. <laughs> yeah, four is really the magic. Every player that I, tour player I work with, four is the goal. And that Average. that is a great test, an eye opener. If you want to play, if, if I'm a, a good junior and I want to play professional or I'm a really a scratch amateur and I think I'm ready to, to, to throw my hat in, 
and go to live in Orlando and become a professional golfer. No. Uh, do that drill and can you do it? I think, you know, that, I think that's a great eye opener. A lot of people go, oh boy. Like, you know, well, like, and I think I, they, I'll get my three putts from eight feet, then I'm bound to make one. And I've worked with some really, really high end players and that drill destroys. Yeah. To a point. And then once they figure it out, they, they kind of run with it. But I think it's a great eye opener. Well, and, it, and you know, to average four, sometimes you're going to make three, sometimes you're going to make five. Yep. It's not maximum four, it's average four. Yeah, that's the key. Sometimes too. you might make two, sometimes you might make six. So for every time you, you don't make enough, you got to make a lot more the next time. So you've got to be able to go higher than four to average four. That's the other thing people don't realize about an average. It's an average is the middle between a higher number and a lower number. I mean, I, I just don't hit four once and I own it. Well, you, I mean, that would, <laughs> you hit four every time. That would be impressive. <laughs> so uh, I guess as we're going to finish up here, what, what one training drill, what idea of what's a great practice, maybe a putting practice look like a great drill or activity that you would really say, um, here's a really good way to assess yourself and then maybe, learn some from, stuff from it and then be able to apply to get you to become a better putter. You have any suggestions out there? Yeah. I mean, I, I have a fairly standard um, assessment. We assess, you know, uh, the P6 conversion. So we assess uh, zero to, you know, three, four, five, six feet. You got to make at least three of them. And even that's not quite enough. You really want to make a little better than that. So either three or four of them, um, nine to 20, you got to make one out of three on average, uh, outside 20. You have to, if you have many putts, you, if you hit four putts, you got to be even par. If you hit six putts, you got to be even par. You just can't be losing shots out there. Um, but what I've seen across the board is, you know, what I do every session, no matter what is speed control touches all of those areas, right? So you can, you always have to be working on speed. It's going to help your three putts. It's going to help your short putts. So you're not jamming them. It's going to help your birdie putts. So you're not leaving too many short, but you're not hitting too many too far. I mean, it's, you always, always, always got to be dialing your speed every single time you play. No, I love that. And I, I think, I think that's been a great eye opener for me as a coach is I've gone much less away from a lot of techniques and, and skill base with face and different abilities to capture how good a putting stroke is. And, and again, I think to me, protocol is always speed. And if speed is good, then immediately I know if Reed is good. Um, Cause I can see where the ball is. And if the read is good, then I know it's a start line issue. And then now I can kind of progress where I think in the past I reversed it. I did everything off the start line and then tried to build outside of that. So I've kind of flipped my model for me as a coach and as a player saying, if we can get speed, right, get that off the board, read, we can get off the board, you know, learn aim point or just whatever system you're using, make sure you know it and it works well for you. Well, you know, Good luck, but Aimpoint. Yeah, good luck. Go to, go to Aimpoint.com uh, uh, <laughs> and, and look that up. And then, then I can find, again, I think it, from my understanding, I thought, you know, face control is important, but I think it's, we overdo it. You know, golfers are really good at overdoing something, right? How many, you know, I always joke on the range, yeah. one more ball. Uh, that wasn't perfect. One more ball. Hour and a half later, one more ball. Um, so we as golfers tend to do things uh, – too deep in certain areas so I think by flipping that model and and again getting players to understand speed and understand how to you know generate speed is a is a huge factor so I, I agree with Mark I do a ton of assessment drills I like to do use the GFI so if you're in the system uh, with our index it shows you what you play and it, it shows me how many greens you hit so I hit 12 greens I hit six in positions so I know roughly right there you're gonna have six shots between you know two and 20 feet so I'm gonna randomly drop that you're gonna have six shots outside of 20 feet. So I'm gonna drop six balls there. And our goal is, I know how many birdies you make, I know. So here's our goal. Our goal is to go three under, can we do it? Um, so that's a really good test for the player, what they do up their average dispersions and how to attack that. And then if they're only averaging one birdie, well, you should be much higher. You're putting it, these zones are not good enough so we can start attacking certain zones. But again, I think that's a great assessment tool just to see where they are. And then from there, we can start breaking down so I think the neat thing about instruction for me and with all my players now is it's there's an assessment, let's figure it out and we go attack, but we don't forget what we're good at, but we attack what we can fix and then we, we keep building that way. Instead of reacting to what just happened, I just played like, I put it terrible, why, don't know. You know, so now take the emotion, here's what the numbers say, here's what the drills say, here's how we get better. I think I've been more efficient as a coach. I would say my players think I've been more efficient and if I'm more efficient, and I'm a better coach, you have to see me less. So that's a good thing all the way around. 
<laughs> yeah. Because yeah. nobody likes players. to see me very long. <laughs> So, uh, all right. So we're going to finish up here. Any uh, closing thoughts, Mark? No, I just, you know, it's, it's really important. Whatever level of golf you are, you have to understand kind of what it takes to move to the next level. And, and usually it's step by step. It's, you don't go from a junior player to tour level stats in, in a week or a month or even a year. You just don't. Um, so you go step by step. You have to understand what each step looks like and you have to train it. And more, most importantly, you have to track it. You have to track are you actually moving the needle or not? If the needle's not moving, you're not being effective. You, you're not being effective. Your coach isn't being effective or the combination of y'all is not being effective. It's got, it's got to be moving. It, it, it might move slowly. That's fine, but it's got to move. And if you're flatlined or going the wrong direction on one of these metrics, you, you got you to gotta make a change. You got to figure out what's, what happened and reverse that. No, I, I love that. I think, again, understanding where you are, where you're trying to go, and now you can make informed decisions. Is it my coach? Is it my equipment? Is it me? Is it the way I'm training? Is it my drills? Is it, you know, again, if you understand what those expectations are, you can actually make really good decisions and figure out how to get there. And I think that's the one thing I've learned more than anything uh, in the last couple of years using Game Forge is, is players can move themselves very efficiently by understanding where they're going. So uh, I want to wish everyone out there better putting. Um, if you need a good golf coach, you can definitely ask us inside of Game Forge where we can refer you. If you're in the uh, greater Florida area, which uh, is fully up and running, and I'm jealous, Virginia, we're still quasi yep. shut down up here. So uh, reach out to Mark Sweeney and uh, go ahead and get Long. yourself a putt lesson. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you for joining the hunt. Um, once again, this was driven by a couple uh, – Instagram posts or feedbacks I got from some uh, listeners. So if there's a name, another part you want us to address inside the GFI on, on what expectations are, how to move from one level to the other, we maybe do short game next. That's the other big one because nobody understands short game and what's really expected. Um, the, the, the dreaded three foot radius circle for all shots. We might get to that in the future, but thank you for joining the hunt. Uh, we appreciate it. And we look forward to you guys uh, listening to future episodes and keep that information coming. Thank you so much. Perfect. That was good, dude. Man, that's like an hour, wasn't it? That was... Uh...